Good morning. I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians this morning, please. Uh, to the second chapter of that epistle, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to read uh, beginning in verse 7 of that, uh, of that context. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 7. Paul writes, But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you'd become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God, and you are our witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And then going to chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and your love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. In our Letters from Heaven class, I've called... Uh, the epistle, 1 Thessalonians. Um, uh, well, I can't remember what I called it now. <laughs> but standing, a faith that stands alone. Faith that stands alone. Uh, and the, um, and, and I, I want to I talk about a faith that stands alone in our, in our message together uh, today um, because it's such an important in, com, component of what is the um, of what makes a healthy believer? Uh, as you've read First Thessalonians this week, I hope you've seen that uh, the Thessalonians were brand new believers. They were brand new Christians, and they had to be left alone by the Apostle Paul and by Silas and Timothy when they were still tender in their faith. And the reason why Paul writes 1 Thessalonians is he wants to express to them the anxiety that he's had over them as, as new children of God, as new believers, and to express to them the concern that he's had about their walk. And he's going to address to them in the last couple chapters of the book some of the things they need to work on in their walk. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those things that he said to them in just, in, in just a little bit. But, but another component of the book is his celebration over the fact that he's been separated them from, from them and, and un, unwillingly. He didn't want to be away from them. But, but Satan thwarted his, his being there and sw Satan thwarted his coming again. But he was finally able to get Timothy there to go and check on them, as we just read in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. And Timothy has brought back a good report that they are standing that, that, their, that their faith is substantive, that they are, they're, they're not slipping, they're not leaving, they are, they are standing firm. And, and so he writes this epistle celebrating that. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is a wonderful book that teaches us about how we need to treat new Christians. A part of my, uh, part of my talking about this message today is that I want us to think about our responsibilities to our new, new sister Dawn to our new young brother, Sage, uh, to another, our another young brother, Peyton, uh, to, a, to a new sister that, that, that came into the Lord recently, Allie Patton. Um, uh, we, we, have a, we have a duty to them. And 1 Thessalonians is a wonderful book about the kinds of things that we need to do, the kinds of things that we need to say, the way that we need to behave and walk with those that are new believers. But, but, it's, but it's also... It's also a great picture of what the goal is for every believer. We need to have, you need to have, uh, 
And, and Dawn needs to find, and Sage needs to find, and Peyton needs to have, and Allie needs to have, uh, and, and Brother Jeff needs to have a, a, a faith that stands alone. But, but I, I, I want us to see as we read the book that, that what, what a faith that stands alone is. It's not, it's not a faith that just, that, that just walks all by yourself, like in isolation. It is a faith that's able to stand because of, of, because of the fact that we've learned to hold on to God. And so what gives you the strength to stand when Paul is not around, and when Timothy's not in town, and when Silas can't hang out with us, and when we're not getting a letter from the Apostle Paul this week, what gives us the strength in all of that is that we are learning more and more to cling to God, to hold on to Him, to hold on to His promises, to, to be assured that He's going to walk with us. And, and listen, folks, when we have a faith that will stand alone, what, one of the things we see in the Thessalonians is that not only would their faith stand when Paul was out of town and when he was not able to write them a letter and when he was not able to send Timothy to come and visit, uh, th they had a faith that stood when they were being persecuted by their fellow citizens. When, 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 when people were, they were trying to walk for God and other folks were trying to push them down and, and were criticizing their way and criticizing their walk and, 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 and persecuting them for their, for their faith. Now that, that is a faith that stands, is when it's standing not only when there's no, when there's no one to catch us, but, but, they're, but, they're, but it's standing when, when folks are trying to push us down. But the only way we have that kind of faith and the only way we plant that in others is when we really learn to cling to God, which means not just telling others you need to hold on to God, but showing them what that looks like because we're holding on to God. <clears throat> and so I want to talk a little bit this morning about the kind of faith that stands alone, the kind of faith that is holding on to God and, 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 and three things that that requires of us if we're going to fulfill that charge, if we're going to walk the way that Paul models for us in 1 Thessalonians <clears throat> and that he tries, to, uh, and that he tries to, to recommend to the Thessalonians and to us. If, if you and I are going to have a faith that stands on its own legs, then one of the things that we've got to do is, is the thing that Paul commends the Thessalonians for doing that's found in chapter 1 and verse 9 when he says this to them, chapter 1, verse 9, he says, they themselves, he's talking about the news about the Thessalonians and how it's gone to other places. He says, they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, standing alone means holding on to God. But if we're going to stand alone and hold on to God, we've got to let go of our idols. We've got to let go of our idols. We are not walking in faith. We're not walking with God. We will never learn. We'll always have to have someone catch us and prop us up if we're holding on to things here that, 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 that are not the walk of a believer. If we're holding on to things here and worshiping things here that, that don't belong in the life of someone who has surrendered to God. Sister Dawn, you got to let go of your idols. And, and, and Sage, even, even at your age, you've got, you got to recognize that there can be things that, you, that are in your life that, that, that the devil can put there that are bigger than God. And Peyton, the same thing's true for you. And brothers and sisters, what is true for them is true for us. we got to let go of our idols. we got to let go of the things in this world that trip us, the things that trap us, the things that blind our vision so that we don't see God. And they are all around us. And you and I have got to go to war against the things that Satan would bring into our life that, so that we don't worship the golden calf, so that we don't fall down and to, to things that, that, don't, that, that don't deserve our affection, that don't deserve our sacrifices, that don't deserve our time, that we don't give place to... to, to we don't give God's place to anything else in our life. So, 
some of us, I'm afraid, are holding on to gods that are takers. Rather than clinging to God who's the great giver. The things that you hold on to in your life that you let get in the way of you and God take from you. God is a giver. He's not a taker. When you... And, and we, we will we'll deceive ourselves into thinking that the reason my life is going wrong is because God is taking from me some way. And so we stay stuck. Our relationships stay broken. We stay angry. We stay... Uh, we, we fall again. We stay poor. We stay broke. We stay burdened. And, 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 we, and, we, and we ask ourselves, why is God doing this to me? Why is God taking things away from me? But, 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 the, but the thing is that we, we, we keep in our lives the things that make us broke. We keep in our lives, we hang on to the things that make us angry. We hold on to the things in our life that, that make us depressed. We hold on to the things that, that, that keep us going back to pleasure and that keep us running after sin because we, we haven't really, we haven't really given up those altars that we're worshiping at that, that keep God from being as great as He would be in our life. Does that make any sense at all? God doesn't take from us. I mean, God will chastise us. God will discipline us. But, but so many of the things, so many of the weights that we carry are weights that we impose on ourselves because we keep trying to hold on to the world rather than really clinging to God. And, and you got to let go. you got to let go of those gods and hold on to Him. Some of us are making the wrongs that others have caused us bigger than God. And so you're, you're bitter and you're, and, you're, and you're sad and you're angry at other people. And because because you, you, you keep repeating what, what, what they did to you or what they said to you or how they, how they wronged you. And, and, and the fact that you, when, you make, when you make the wounds that others cause you and the wrongs that others do you, when, they, when you make them so big that you, can't, that you can't trust God to heal, that you, you can't trust that if you, if you just keep doing the right thing, God will make you well. Don't, don't let the wrongs that others have done you be an idol that blocks your view of God. That could have happened to the Thessalonians. I mean, their family and their friends and their neighbors were throwing rocks at them because of their faith. But they didn't let the fact that, of how their society or how their family... were, And that they were treating them unjustly because they loved God. But they didn't let that be bigger than their trust in God. And they didn't let that hush them from talking. They kept, they kept sharing their faith because they believed that God who raised Jesus from the dead was bigger than that. And you and I have to trust that. Jen and I talked about how we can let the news of the day be an idol for us. We have stopped, and this is, was Jen's choice. We don't listen to the first 15 minutes of the news in the morning. Because it ends up dominating our thinking and our, and our, and our, I mean, our talking getting ready in the morning. God is, God is, God is bigger than that. You know, if... If, if in Paul's day, if, if Caesar could tweet, I, I mean, if there was a Facebook page for the Roman Empire, then, then the news that would have been coming out of the capital, would, would have, would have, it would have all been bad. And, and, because it was, and, it, and even more so because it was a nation that didn't, that didn't know anything about Jehovah. It was a nation that was, that was rank with idolatry. 
it, it, was, a, it was a Caesar that was completely obsessed with his, with, with, with his own uh, God complex. And so anything that was coming out of there would not have been something that would have been uplifting to the faith of, of the believers. But, but I got to, I can't let what's going on in the world around me dominate my life and my perspective so that I don't see that what God is doing in the world doesn't have anything to do with what's going on in Washington. Or if it does, God will work that in some way with what his plan is to save mankind. God is bigger than America. He is bigger than what's going on here in Chelsea. God is bigger than the burdens and the problems in our lives and what politicians think and what they say and what laws they pass. And what's, what's going on in our culture as it disintegrates morally? God is bigger than all of that. He is. He is. And so I can't let the news of the day be an idol for me. I can't let my, 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 the biggest thing that I wrestle with is my pride. It's the biggest thing that I wrestle with. When I was, a, when I was five, uh, my mom used, would take the, my white t-shirts and she would, she'd draw a, a red S on them. And she'd take a, a towel and she would safety pin it around my neck. And I'd go fly around the yard. And I wanted her to, I wanted her to dye my hair black. Because it was, when I was toe-headed when I was a kid. I was just, 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 just like, like Andrew. And I, and I, but I, I, wanted, I wanted black hair like Superman. And I, 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 I re, that, that is a metaphor for my life in this respect. Most of the big sins and the things that have really trapped me have occurred because I want to be Superman. Because I want to know and I want to have an answer, and I want to have a solution. And I want people to see me as, as being the person who can get it done, who can say, here I come to save the day. And I, and I show up and I, and I, and I rescue, and I, and I help people with whatever it is that's going on. I, I want to be Superman. I am not Superman. I am not Superman. I will never be. And I have to tell myself that. Because I want to be Superman. But I am not. I am not. And I won't ever be. And I've got to get rid of the pride that, that causes me. This is, what it, this is how it causes me to sin. It causes me to overcommit. Because I, I, I want to be able to help people. And so I don't want to tell people, no, I can't do that. Or no, I won't do that. I, 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 want, to, I want to come and save the day. And, and it, it causes me to... It causes me to put myself at times in compromising situations for my faith because I think I'm, I can handle this. Other people can't handle it, but I can walk into this and I'll be okay because here I come to save the day. And that's a pride problem. That's an idol. Do you see that? It's an idol. Now, your pride problem might manifest it in other ways. It might be that you can't say that you can't say when you're wrong, you can't say, I'm sorry. Man, you need to smash that idol. I mean, you need to put it on the altar and you need to burn it, you need to break it, you need to get rid of it. It might be that you can't say that you're wrong. You need to learn to be able to say that. What, what, what is it that you're holding on to? that trips you, that traps you, that, that blocks your view of God. If you're going to hold on to God, you've got to let go. You've got to turn it loose. You've got to get rid of it. I, I, I have not, I, I, I'm still wrestling with the idea, I, don't, I, I still have a problem with trying to be Superman. I, and you need to know that about me. But I am trying to, I am trying to get rid of that in my life. Help me. And you get rid of that, whatever it is in your life. Let's get rid of those things. And hold on to God and not on to things that are lesser than Him. Secondly, if we're going to hold on to God, if we're going to stand alone, we not only need to let go of our idols. Look, if you would, with me at chapter 
um, 2 and verse 13 and what Paul says there. He says, And for this reason we also constantly thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. One, one of the things we've got to do if we're going to, if we're going to uh, stand alone, have a faith that has legs, if we're going to have a faith that holds on to God so that we have legs, we've got to own His Word. We've got to own His Word and we've got to own His will for us. And, and I, 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 I'm so afraid as we talk this year about being in the Word that some of us have just turned that message off. I know that some of you are really trying because you told me about what you're doing with your kids and about what you're doing with your family and how you're finding what, 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 what's working. But, but I am so fearful for those of us that aren't doing that. And I, I, we've got too many people here for, for everyone to be on board with that. I am worried about us not making the Word of God a part of our day, about not really owning the Word. And I want you to see that the Thessalonians were doing that. He said, when we, when we taught you, when we preached to you, we didn't, just, we didn't just fall all over the words that you were speaking, Paul. That they, were, they accepted it not because it was so eloquent. They accepted it not because it was so entertaining. They accepted it what it really was, that as Paul was speaking, these words were golden. This motivation was special. These promises, the things that he, these messages were so treasured by them because they recognized that as they were speaking, that they were learning the word of God. God is speaking to us. This letter is from heaven. It's not from, it's not from Athens where Paul is writing from. It's a letter from heaven. This is God's word to us. And oh, I want to know, God, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to see? What do you want me to have? What do you want me to believe? What do you want me to do? That they owned it. They owned it. And we've got to be a people, if we're going to have a faith that will stand, we've got to own the word of God. We've got to own his word, his word and his will for us. And that means, brothers and sisters, that you've got to be in it and not just around it. I mean, you're around a lot of people today who have their Bibles open, but not all of you even have your Bibles open this morning. Why is that? Why, why aren't we in the Word together? Has it been open this week beside, before today? I mean, were you, were you in it this last week at all? You've got to be in it, not just around it, not just around people who are reading it, not just around people who are talking about it, not just around people who are preaching about it. You've got to be in it yourself. You got to be in it, not just around it. You got to also stop just making plans and start taking steps. You got to stop just making plans and start taking steps. This is what I mean. Go to chapter 4 and, and, and look with me at some of the things that Paul needed to talk to them about. If they were going to walk the way that they needed to walk, here are some of the things that he, that, he, that he had to say to them. In chapter 4 and verse 3, he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor. One of the things that they needed to stop making plans about and stop do, start doing was to stop having casual sex. That was a problem in Thessalonica. Some of them were fornicators. Some of them were adulterers. Some of them were homosexuals just like they were in Corinth. And they needed to stop doing that. They needed to stop it. And listen, brothers and sisters, if that's where you're walking, you need to quit it. You need to stop it. And you need to own that not because I say it and not because I jump up and down and not because I raise my voice and not because I try to be persuasive in what I say. You need to stop it because God said it. God wants you to be holy for him. God wants you to be pure for him. God wants your, your, your body to be his temple. Now, you got to own that. Don't just make plans that someday I'm going to stop it. Make a step. Take a step. He, he says in verse 9, 
Now as to the love of brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves know you're taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it. But we urge you at the end of verse 10, we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Now, stop making plans to have people over and start taking a step, would you? Stop making plans about how you're going to get more connected and start, and start taking a step. Stop making plans about how you're going to love and how you're going to show that love and how you're going to show care and how you're going to write a card and how you're going to make a call and how you're going to say a prayer. And, and, and do it. Don't just make a plan. Do it. Start making a step. Start taking a step. And we are not just, we can't be hearers of the word. We've got to be doers, folks. Do it. Take a step. We, we've read through James. We've read through Galatians. Have you made any steps after reading through James and after reading through Galatians. Take a step. Don't just make a plan. In chapter 5, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, there, there, look, look, look back at chapter, uh, uh, chapter uh, 4 and verse 11. He says, To make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to attend your own business and to work with your own hands, just as we commanded you so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and not be any, in, in any need. Some of, the, some of the brethren there in Thessalonica were lazy. There were, there were some of them that were lazy. They needed to go get busy. So they needed to go get a job. They, they needed to do something to be self-sufficient. They, 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 needed, they, they, needed to, they needed to do something. If that fits you, take a step. Well, whatever it is that you need to change, take a step. Don't just listen to the Word. Do something about the Word. Take a step. And watch how God blesses it. One, uh, one other... Uh, one other admonition about owning his word. And that is that you got to chew it before you swallow it. You got to chew it before you swallow it. And this, this, is, what I, this is what I mean by that. Go, go, go back to what Paul said to the Thessalonians in verse 13 when he said, We also constantly thank God that when you receive from us the word of God, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. How did they know it was the word of God? He, he, he says so much in chapter 2 about the way that he and Silas and Timothy behaved when they were there because they, they, wanted, they wanted the people to know that their motives in coming were genuine. They weren't looking for something. They, they weren't... They weren't uh, they, they, there, was nothing, there was nothing manipulative. Uh, there was nothing shady about the relationships that they were building with them. That they came just as God's messengers... And they hoped that their motives in doing that were validated by the way that they behaved. But So Paul, as he's saying those things, admits that they had the right to test them as messengers. That they had the right to examine. Now, why is Paul, why, why is he going there? Why is he saying that? Why are they, why are they, why are they making tents? Why are they doing those things? Why did they get run out of Philippi? How come Paul and Silas showed up and their, and their faces are all bruised and, they've, and their backs are all, uh, they got scars on them because they were in jail in Philippi. What did they do wrong that people are treating them that way? The people had a right to ask those questions. They had a right to chew on, to test the things that Paul was saying and the way that Paul was behaving before they swallowed the things that Paul was teaching them. Not only did they have a right to do that, they had an obligation to do that. You've got to do that. You don't swallow the things that I say. You don't swallow the things that anyone teaches or anyone says. You've got to chew it before you swallow it. You've got to make sure it's real. And if you don't do it, you'll choke on it. You will. Because there'll be something, there'll be something, it'll catch in your throat because it, 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 you'll, you'll come across an experience where you haven't really digested it, where the message is not really yours, where it's not a part of you, and if it's not a part of you, you won't die for it, and you are, you are not the kind of believer that Jesus has called us to be if you won't die for the faith that he's called us to have. I, I believe that. I believe that the message that Jesus has given me to, to teach and to practice is a message that I need to give my life for, that I need to be willing to give my life for. And I've got to really have that message 
I've got to digest it. It's got to be a part of my heart. I have to know the reasons why I believe what I believe and why I practice what I practice. Our college and careers had a Bible study over at uh, Landry and Laura's on Friday night. And uh, we, were, we were reading through and, and talking about Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, I said something, just sharing in the class, and Anna Pfeiffer uh, asked a question about it, challenged that. And I just, I, I want to say to you, Anna, and I want to say to all of us, we got to do that. I gave an answer, but it wasn't a very good answer. I, I don't think I satisfied the question that she asked. I got to get better at giving an answer. I, and, and we need to talk some more about the thing that she asked. Now, she's got to test it. She's got to try it. She's got to challenge it. She's got to chew on it. Does that make sense? Does that fit in with everything else I understand about what God said? And we need to be a congregation where we don't just encourage it, but where we insist on it. You've got to chew on the truth. You've got to make it yours. And if it ain't yours then you will not die for it. If it ain't yours, then you've not owned it. You can't parrot what I preach. You can't parrot what I think. you got to test it and chew on it yourself before you swallow it, folks. And if I don't tell you to do that, if I don't encourage you to do that, if I don't admonish you to do that, then get rid of me. Please tell me to go away because I am not helping you. You, you, need, you need someone that's going to share with you the word in a way that helps you make it yours. I can't, you, you, you can't get to heaven on my faith. You got to have your own. And we got to be a people who are helping each other to find our own. Thirdly, let me say to you um, that if we're going to um, stand alone, and if we're going to hold on to God, then, then we've got to, uh, and this might si sound contradictory, but it's not. We've got to step into one another's lives. E even though Paul wanted them to stand alone, that, that didn't mean that he just, he was hands off. Just, we'll, we'll see if they make it or not. He, he, was, he, was, he was earnest to come and to check on them. And he knew that even, even, when they, even with the things that they learned and even with the, with the strength that they acquired, that they were, were going to need more help. And so he says, even after he celebrates Timothy coming, look, if you would, at chapter 3 and verse 11. He says, chapter 3, 11, he says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we may also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord. I'm sorry, that's, not the, that's the wrong verse. Read all that to you and it's the wrong passage. Go back, to verse, go back to verse 10. He says, We night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your faith, face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Um, he celebrated the progress that they made, but he still wanted to come and contribute what he could to their ongoing maturity. He wanted to, he, he, he had been forced to step out of their lives. He wanted to step back into their lives. And, and part, of our, part of our standing alone and our holding on to God, I mean, I, I've got to learn to do that on my own. Whether you're, whether you're standing with me or not, I've got to learn to hold on to God myself. You've got to learn to do that too. But, but part of my holding on to God is helping you reach up and hold on to Him too. And part of your holding on to God is that you're grabbing my hand and you're helping me to hold on to Him too. And so part of the work of holding on to him is that I'm helping you to hold on to him and that we're doing, but we're holding on to him, not to each other. We're holding on to him. And, and, and we, we, we've got to do that for each other. That, that's part of how, and the Thessalonians got, have got to learn to do that. They've got to learn to do that for each other, to help each other hold on to God and to, and to help and to, and to pull, bring others along so that they hold on to God too. We are not the ch same church that we were four years ago. What, what I mean by that is that we've got, uh, 
the complexion of the group here has changed. And we have a lot of people that weren't here four years ago. And not all of you know each other. And because not all of you know each other, not all of you trust each other. How do you feel about that? What are you going to do about that? But we, brethren, having been bereft of you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager to, with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan thwarted us. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, chapter 3, verse 1, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. Paul was worried about his new brothers and his new sisters. And so he stepped into their lives. And when Satan tried to keep him from stepping into their lives, he kept praying about it, and he tried another way. But he was insistent that he was going to get into their lives, that he was going to see them face to face, and he was going to know what was going on there. And if he couldn't go, then Timothy was going to go. But, but he was going to have some face time with them so that he could know where they were. I believe that I'm obliged to do that with you. And there is not a family here, there is not a soul here. And please, please correct me if this is wrong. I mean, come to me and, and say, no, you didn't do that with me. There is not a soul here that I haven't made an effort to connect to. I mean, I've tried to spend personal time with our people here. And not because I'm the preacher, and not because you pay me to do it. But because I'm a Christian, and you're my brother, and you're my sister... And I don't care if you've been here 40 years or if you've been here four minutes. I, 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 feel the, I feel the compulsion to connect to you. And I am not an extrovert. When I was a kid, I wanted, besides being Superman, I wanted to be a fire ranger. I mean, I wanted to be out in the woods and not be around people. I don't need to be around people to be happy. I was going to be a chemical engineer when I was in college. It doesn't, I, don't, I have no need to be in front of people. I have no need to have people hear me talk. I know you can't believe that because I talk so much. But, but there's, there's nothing in me that cries for an audience. And there's nothing in me that cries for company. I am what I am and I do what I do because I believe that God, God has called me and that God has charged me and that I am obliged to do it. And I want you to feel that burden too. Not, I, not that you have to practice it to the same extent. But you need to step into the life of your brother. And you need to step into the life of your sister. And you don't just need to talk to the people you've always talked to. And love the people that you've always loved. You need to love the new people. And the new people, you need to come in here and you need to get connected to the old people. I think I've told you the story before about uh, going out with uh, Henry Horton uh, to uh, help him bring in feed corn for his cows. And Brother Henry, was, uh, he was a leading member of the church in Oak Ridge where I grew up. And as uh, Henry and I were shucking corn and throwing the ears in the back of his pickup truck, I was, uh, man, I was giving the brethren what for. Now, I was, I was a teenager, but I, I'd, I'd gotten wise. And so I was telling him what was wrong with this and what was wrong with that and what was wrong with this sister and what was wrong with that brother. And Brother Horton wisely did not say a word the whole time that I talked. He just, he just let me shuck. And I, when I was done shucking... Then Henry, without looking up, said, Well, Brother Moore, what are you going to do about that? Well, I wasn't telling him so that I would do something about it. I was telling him so he'd do something about it. 
And he took care of that real fast. He put it back in my lap. He put it back in my, in my, on my plate. I've been a part of churches that talked about people and not to people. And I ain't going to be a part of that anymore. I want to be a part of a people. I want to lead a mission. I want to lead a movement where we talk to people, not about people. If you've got a brother or sister that you're worried about, I don't want to hear about it. They need to hear about it. If you're worried about them, don't come talk to me. Go tell you go talk to them. I've been talking to them. And I'm going to keep on talking to them. And I'm going to keep on talking to you. But we are not a family that talks about people. We're a family that talks to people. We talk to each other. We step into one another's lives. And we help each other grow. And if there's something that I don't know that I need to know, if there's something that I need to preach that I ain't preaching, then come and talk to me. But, but you go and you talk. If there's something that you see that someone needs to know, that someone needs to hear, you go talk to them. What are you going to do about it? I say that, brothers and sisters, because I love you. I say it because I want us to glorify God in our walk. I think it was Thursday, Ken, that you went with me up to the hospital. Uh, Ken, uh, Kelly went with me up to the hospital on uh, Thursday to go see Megan. And she was feeling miserable. And uh, Ken, he was just the person she needed to see. One of the things I respect so much about Brother Ken is um, he humbly confessed before us. The burden that he felt about not stepping into the lives of his brothers and into the lives of the lost and that he wanted to, he wanted to do that differently. He, like me, is not an, he's not an extrovert. But he's been redeeming the time. And he's been doing the things that were awkward and things that are uncomfortable. You know why he's sitting up here today? Because he made a vow that he was going to come and sit in the middle of the young people. Because he wants to be an influencer among them. If Ken can do it, you can do it, brother. If Ken can do it, you can do it, sister. Let's stop making excuses for why it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not on me, it's on you. It's not my obligation, it's your obligation. You're the preacher, you go do it. it it's, not, it's not me, it's somebody, one of our older men needs to do it. Yes, they do. Our older men do need to do it. And our younger men, they need to do it too. I walk into restaurants and I see all the, you go into Bojangles and all the old men are sitting over in the table in the corner and there aren't any young men at the table. And over on the other side of the room are the young men and they're sitting at the table. How come the old men and the young men aren't sitting at the same table? We need the old men and the young men here. I mean, here, right here at Chelsea, sitting at the same table and talking over the same book. How am I going to learn from you that are wise if you don't talk to me? But don't just talk to me. Talk to Brandon. Talk to Curtis. Talk to Scott. Talk to Chris. Talk to Jason. Talk to Caleb. Talk to Landry. Talk to John Dean. And, and all of you guys talk to, talk to your seniors too. If all we do is talk to our peer group, if, if the only relationships we build are just the relationships that are cozy because we've been together so long, we were here when it was the little house, and we were, we were here when it was over in the cafeteria. It, it, it ain't the cafeteria anymore. And it ain't the little house. 
And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, we, we have not even been evangelistic yet. Our growth has not come because we've been reaching the lost. Our growth has come only because brethren have been shifting around. We, 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 have, we have not gone out and we've not gone out into the fields and harvested the lost. We, we've just been here and folks have just happened to come. That is not New Testament Christianity. That is not New Testament growth. That is not evangelism. And, and I don't say that. To, I, I, I'm so glad for, for, for folks that are new, that are a part of us. I'm not criticizing that. I'm criticizing the fact that there's not more than that. That we're not stirring the water every week. It convicts me that in Acts 2, God increased the people there daily. And we are not a New Testament church until we are baptizing somebody 365 days a year. That was New Testament Christianity. I mean, they were growing. And we are paltry. We are pitiful. I'm so convicted by the fact that God is not bringing us more people. And the only conclusion I have about that is that we ain't ready or he would be bringing them. We ain't talking or we would be finding them. We ain't sowing or we would be reaping. And if we can't step into each other's lives, and we are not going to step into the life of someone who is a Gentile. We're not going to step into the life of someone that's a sinner. Because that's when it really gets messy. But if our brothers and sisters that have just come from other places and the swelling that we've experienced, if that's too messy for you, then reaching out to the lost is... I don't know how we're going to do it. If we're going to be a people that stand alone and that hold on to God, we've got to let go of our idols. We've got to own His Word and His will for us. And we've got to stop letting Satan thwart us from stepping into one another's lives. God will make a way, just like He did for Paul, if we won't quit if we'll all make that burden ours, yours, mine, and not just push that burden on someone else. Well, I've talked too long today. I'm sorry for that. But you all sure have listened, like you always do, so kindly, and I appreciate that, and I love you. Please don't take the fact that I, I know I holler too much, and I know that I spit too much. Yeah, this is the splash zone, you know, if you're in the first couple rows. But I love you. I really do. And I want to glorify God in my life. I don't want to step back from that at all. And I want us to glorify God. And we need a faith that will stand alone. And when we do, we'll glorify Him. Won't you come to Jesus this morning if you've not put him on and made him yours? Won't you own him? And won't you let him own you? Won't you have your sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb this morning? Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?